presentations on your portrayal of your understanding of the poem on the hex grid, right? What I want you to do in your groups is to figure out a couple things. One, um, I think we should get the poem read before you do your presentation. So someone from your group should actually read the poem. So it's in all of our heads, right? Two, um, who's going to discuss your overall understanding of the poem? What's going on, story, action, those sorts of things, right? And then beyond that, figure out who's going to say what about your layout that in indicates the various relationships among all the parts, you know, what touches what, why this section does or does not border this section, why it's way over here. For example, I'm looking at the second from the right back there and I can't read what's on it, but I definitely see that the orange is not messing around at all with the purple or the green, right? So some thought went on into that. I hope some thought went into that. I want to hear your thinking on uh, all that. So I'll give you about say 10, 15 minutes to discuss who's going to do what in your groups, okay? All right. One of the most stressful things for IB students is that dreaded 12th grade oral, uh, their oral exam. And I wanted to start getting students very used to oral, developing oral arguments and oral criticism going way back in ninth grade. So I had my students do, I think, two orals. Um, using explain everything and as I was listening to them I was pretty impressed with how comfortable they were feeling and the criticisms that they were making but I noticed one thing you know was troubling me and that was that they weren't making connections between or among the points they were discussing and they're all related wait I'm confused already Donish you said everything touches everything uh, yes all the colors touch um, well, I'll explain which... Because I don't see any yellow touching orange or... Yeah, I was going to I'll explain that. Okay. So, um, the... They would, for example, say, and now I'm going to talk about the diction. And now I'll talk about the rhyme. Sometimes they would literally do that. Um, other times I could feel the separations in their analysis. And, of course, what I wanted them to do was to bring those parts together into a complete understanding of the poem rather than doing what we really try to work very hard against dissecting a poem or a piece of literature. And it's exactly what they were doing. They were breaking it up into parts and not putting them together. And then, okay, I'm doing action. So I'd be like, like Marina said, action is surrounding all of them because action is influenced by every single category. Even before I had started these orals, that I was looking at hexagon grids. And the reason I'm fascinated with hexagon grids has nothing to do with school. I'm a strategy gamer. And if you do a lot of, say, military strategies or, or any kind of strategy game, you come across hex grids because they define relationships, they define territories, they show boundaries, points of intersection. And I thought that somewhere along the line, um, I might be able to use a hex grid to show some sort of relationships. Um, they show relationships in several ways, the boundaries that they share and actually the amount of influence. Obviously the more hexes, the more influence something has. So it occurred to me, and I really never put those two things together until one day I was driving to work after I was listening to those orals and I was thinking, what can I do, what can I do? And I thought, maybe we can do something with, with the hex grids. In the groups, they had to defend their own orals and then they had to make changes. They had to come to some agreements on um, imagery works best with diction to convey this, or this poem structure is the dominant force in this poem. Um, and in, then they would have to decide, you know, what bordered what and, and things like that. It prepared them, I think, for the oral presentation in that they had to do quite a lot of debate. 
in, in their groups. They had to defend their positions, argue them, and be willing to relinquish or adjust. What's particularly interesting um, about your association, you're bringing in math, is this entire semester I modeled my group work after what they are doing in math. In, in math, of course, they're giving them problems to, to deal with. And in the group, they have to come to some sort of resolution to the problem. But the most important thing that I, uh, that came, that I brought into play from math, again, was the problem-solving nature of group work. And that's what I've been doing in, in English class. They are in assigned groups. I keep them in those groups for, for an extended period of time. I give them English problems to solve, which is really a reflection of math problems. I don't give them answers. I ask them to come to a resolution. You ask how this affected their presentation. The presentation was their, their group resolution of the problem. And they understood in that presentation that everybody needed to be able to explain it. You talked about how the simile is at the end of the poem. And because it's the end of the poem, it changes how you think about everything. So what do you think about that at least touching a hex or two on structure because it was placed right at the end of the poem. Might or not. It's your grid. Or did you not think of that when you were? Uh, I think about that because when we were thinking about the structure, we were thinking more of the hypothetical thoughts of the, like the, it, how the punctuation in free verse enabled us to understand that it was the thoughts of the speaker yep. and um, how the free verse in a way mimicked the flow of the river itself. Right. And so we didn't really think about it. Um, the We didn't really think that the last two lines, being that they were just the last two lines. Yeah, I get that. But sometimes, you know, look for that in, in poems before, especially beginnings and endings. Because you commented on the beginning of this, right? And how the title bleeds right into the poem. Yeah. That's planned. And the effect that had. And then that ending. And those are structural choices. So, you know, sometimes look at those. It's lovely what you did there. I would just think you might bring in a little touch there with that simile on a structural choice. Because it does, you're right. It changes how you think about the poem. The way I had grouped them to work on their hex grids reflected um, the poems they had. There were um, three poems for them to pick from. The grid itself, the visual grid, is sort of a platform for them to now present their argument. That this is what we thought this author was doing when she put this poem together. This prioritized over that. And that's what I wanted from them, and I wanted them all to be able to do that, to bring all those concepts together. I didn't want them just to go up and point, diction touches on, you know, um, imagery. I wanted them to explain their thinking behind the associations, their thinking behind the size. I wanted them to be able to justify everything they put on there. What's a sexy sky? You ever looked at the sky? <laughs> Said, sex. <laughs> <laughs> that was a uh, Mrs. Tilcher's class, right? And that poem's about an adolescent, um, students moving from primary school through, through adolescence, and an adult looking back and, and remembering all that. But I raised that issue, sexy sky, not because I wanted to just have sort of a, oh, an intriguing moment in class. It's exactly the kind of expression that students will read, see, acknowledge, chuckle on, and then not think about. No, I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily like, like sex. It's more like romance. And uh, if, if, like for example, like a sunset or something like that, it, it, it could be considered as like romantic. And that's why we put uh, like love and, and uh, love, love right here and sex because they, they go they go together. Yeah, they and I wanted them to really express what they thought "sexy sky" meant. You know, was she really saying, um, "Let's go out and have sex with the sky"? I think I, I, I threw out there if you want to take it literally. And of course, you know, no one thought that, but but everyone laughed about it. A number of students in the end, I think, tied it into the 
the thunderstorm imagery that she, that she was breaking down there where she was using a thunderstorm as a metaphor for breaking through adolescence and you know moving into adulthood and I had an interesting discussion with you guys about security and sex anyone care to because you have those sharing boundaries there and anyone looking at your grid there would be asking themselves why did they put security and sex side by side so if someone want to elaborate on that then I'll let you guys go um, yeah uh, the reason that we put them side by side is that we have evidence in the final stanza that they could be related so they they introduce the final stanza by saying uh, by saying that they are under the heavy sexy sky uh, while they are still inside of the gates of their school but in the last two lines of the poem they say you ran through the gates impatient to be grown as the sky split open into a thunderstorm so the sky splitting open it seems like a sex metaphor and um, running through the gates is like the entrance into the real world so that's why we said security as in opening the gates and uh, finding the, and leaving the security of the school she had had a number of other sort of sexual mild sexual references moving through the poem so they saw some consistency in the imagery but I mainly wanted to draw attention to it because I figured Maybe they didn't think this through, right? And the beauty of a term like that is, you know, you, it, it's another perfect example of a student wonders what the author meant. I'm sure she had something in mind, but her meaning could never equal what you would think. And I think they would get a sense of that, that there's no way this author could think what I'm thinking about Sexy Sky. And I think it's a good example of that. My main goal for the assignment, anyhow, wasn't actually to create a hex grid. It was for them to spend a considerable amount of time talking about how everything works together. You know, uh, I'd be surprised if they realized that was the real intention of the assignment. They might have thought the assignment was actually that. But it really was just to, for them to talk about how everything works together. And I'm hoping in their next orals that when I hear those orals that I get more cohesive approaches.